Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come and free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book everyone and welcome to Karmic Evolution's Astrologically Speaking podcast. I'm your host Sherry Horn Hassan of Karmic Evolution Astrology and I'm coming to you on March 31st, 2023 from Ta Contact Talk Radio. Just a quick reminder that this show aims to bring you the truth about astrology and your soul's karmic evolution. First, my usual boring housekeeping stuff, which is to tell you you can listen to this podcast anytime by simply going to my website at karmicevolution.com, clicking on the upper right-hand banner of the portion labeled podcast, and scrolling down the page to hear the most recent show, and or to search the archived listings for past shows that you might have missed or to which you'd like to listen again. And just another reminder, the show drops now every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific, and 2 p.m. Eastern. So you can listen live or you can listen anytime after that. And while you're on that page, you'll see above the most recently posted show a downloadable freebie labeled How to Keep Your Sun Sign Happy, which is friendly advice for every sun sign from renowned evolutionary astrologer Stephen Forrest about what each of us, depending on our sun sign, needs to be happy. And just so you know, this is based on an interview I did with Stephen a couple of years ago, and he's given me permission to distribute it more widely because he believes that uh, promoting the validity of astrology in our lives is a great thing. And yes, if you download it, it will sign you up for my weekly Conversations About Consciousness newsletter, but you can, of course, unsubscribe anytime. So be sure to grab it when you listen to this podcast, whether you do so live or anytime after the fact, and enjoy some words of astrological wisdom. And separately, you can always follow me on my Facebook page, which is Karmic Evolution for Your Soul, where you can keep track of upcoming podcast content and other astro news you can use. I'm also posting now on Instagram under karmic.evolution, so feel free to follow me there as well. Now, finally, I'm offering still my discounted 75-minute Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading for only $125, and that's an offer made to radio show listeners only, or podcast listeners. So if you're interested in astrology and you would like to learn more about the true meaning of your individual birth chart so that you can gain greater consciousness about what is your soul's true mission and purpose in this lifetime, and you'd like to move from chaos to clarity about what might be holding you back now from achieving your most cherished desires in the areas of what's usually of most uh, greatest interest to all people, either all of these or some of these or one of these, your relationships, your career and your job, your finances, and or your health. So if this is what you're interested in, then this reading is for you. And it will look at how the energies into which you entered this lifetime from may be keeping you stuck in old habitual patterns or what I call conditioned behavior and how this knowledge can assist you to make different, more positive choices moving forward. So if you'd like to co-create your own future happiness through astrological insight, I'm going to tell you that's easy when you take advantage of my special discounted offer at karmicevolution.com slash karmic125. Now, at that price, conscious awareness has never been so easy or so affordable. All right, so 
Now let's get into this week's astro news. And there's a lot that's been going on. So um, I can't cover it all. There's more that I want to say. And it frustrates me when I put these podcasts together because I'm like, okay, what is the most important thing and blah, blah, blah. But as many who are um, steady listeners know, a lot of times I like to look back so that we can see the cause and effect of what's leading us to where we are now and then ahead into the future. So first, let's look back to the Mercury-Jupiter conjunction in Aries, which occurred late on March 27th or early on the 28th, depending on your time zone. And that happened just after Mercury met wounded healer Chiron there, uh, meaning there in Aries, on March 26th. So while many astrologers will tout this as a great time to sign business contracts and solidify agreements to expand prospects for the future, I would caution everyone to not forget that Mercury's meetup with wounded healer Chiron occurred in Aries the day before, as I said, on March 26th. So that means that Mercury, Jupiter, and Chiron in Aries are traveling together now, and they're forming a stellium which is a group of more than three planets together in the same sign, which will be opposed by the Libra full moon at 16 degrees and seven minutes of the Libra Aries polarity coming up next week at 9.34 p.m. Pacific time on on April 5th and 12.34 a.m. Eastern time on April 6th. So I'm going to get into that more later, but... What I want people to understand is that this stellium can expand our sense of woundedness around rhetoric or communication, be it spoken or written or drawn, which in turn may expand our anger. And when the Libra full moon opposes and highlights this this stellium next week, Because what happens with a full moon, of course, is that the moon reflects the light of the sun back onto itself, revealing to it its shadow or hidden side. And that's why we release at full moon, because we can see what's no longer necessary or what is old baggage or however you want to call it that you don't want to drag into the next new moon cycle two weeks later. So we work between the full moon and the coming new moon to release this stuff. So what we're going to want to do at the Libra full moon is to release any anger caused by these, you know, wounds that have caused us pain and hurt in the past and find a new way or new ways to express ourselves that that can bring greater healing rather than lashing out violently ever could. So combined with the kind of uber sensitivity brought about by Mars entrance into Cancer and the war gods quincunx to nuclear powered Pluto in Aquarius from March 25th, we've already seen how this can manifest in violence. And that's because whenever Mars and Pluto are in frictional aspect to each other, and that includes by conjunction, square, opposition, and quincunx, and that's just to use the aspects that are considered most powerful in modern astrology, such energy might trigger what I call ruthless, violent, and potentially annihilating actions. So in short, these two planets and aspect to each other can cause Mars energy to ignite Pluto's nuclear fuse. However, I'd like to remind everyone again that astrological aspects and the heavenly bodies themselves do not dictate how we act or react to their energies. Rather, there's a whole archetypal range of ways in which we may act or react based on the as above, so below philosophy. And that's where, you know, astrology gets so interesting because on an individual basis, I don't know how you're going to respond to, to a particular aspect, I can see, like I said, the range of potential ways you would probably respond, but you, every one of us brings a different set of energies from our, our individual natal birth charts to the equation, right? Now, 
And that has to do also with how we perceive the energies that we came in with. But without going down that rabbit hole, what I want to say is that on a personal level, we can use any Mars-Pluto aspects when they touch our individual charts to channel their volcanic energies into transforming our anger into positive motivation for change for the better. In other words, together, Mars and Pluto can provide us the opportunity to evolve. It's just that with frictional aspects as opposed to softer aspects like sextiles and trines, such evolution may not be painless or particularly smooth. And remember, when dealing with the moon-ruled archetype of cancer's sensitive nature, we can always take the dial on sensitive and turn it up to maximum, as my mentor Stephen Forrest likes to say. And we can also see how, when archetypal cancer feels threatened, she'll retreat. And if, when Mars is in cancer, you make her mad enough, she might resort to hell hath no fury like a woman scorned rhetoric or action. So in other words, if cancer gets mad enough, she wants to go, if she's hurt enough, she goes into her shell. But if she's mad enough, she's going to come running out of that shell and attack you. So if we go back and look at this particular March 25th Mars-Pluto quincunx again, from Mars and Cancer to Pluto and Aquarius, we can see how it caused some folks to overreact and to lash out when hurt, rather than dealing with their pain more consciously. And we can see how others were motivated by Mars to push through their hurt and expand their consciousness around how to better process past wounds, both more positively and productively. Now, it's always been interesting to me how some people go from zero to 100, straight from being hurt to becoming angry. And, and, I, and I believe this is particularly true for anyone who was taught early in life not to show fear, not to show hurt, not to express pain, because they are again taught to believe that doing so is a sign of weakness. So to put it all together more clearly, starting on March 24th, just before Mars entered Cancer, and less than two hours later, Quincunx, Pluto, and Aquarius on March 25th, and as Mercury waxed into his conjunction with wounded healer Chiron on March 26th, and then to his conjunction with Jupiter in Aries on the 27th or the 28th, depending on your time zone, forming this stellium or the group of three planets close together in the same sign, we witnessed events that mirrored back to us the shadow side of these martial energies Again, as Mars in Cancer and Jupiter in Mars ruled Aries, I pointed this out last week, while Jupiter's in Aries, his dispositor, he's going to react to Mars because Mars rules Aries and Jupiter's uh, transiting through Mars' sign. And Mars has a connection to the moon because he's transiting through Cancer. So I am pointing out that, again, that we witnessed events that mirrored back to us the shadow side of these energies as Mars and Cancer and Jupiter and Mars ruled Aries exploded into Mercury-driven, angry, hyperbolic, threatening rhetoric and violent actions. Now, these examples of how anger born of hurt may manifest occurred also as we were waxing toward the March 28th Moon-Mars conjunction, followed less than an hour and a half later by the first quarter square of the monthly waxing lunar cycle of the Cancer Moon to the Aries Sun. So you can see we've got a lot of Mars and Cancer and you know Aries and expansive Jupiter and communicative Mercury and all this woundedness going on was kind of mushed all together. And ultimately, what we saw were several violent and upsetting events within the collective caused by both individuals and by Mother Nature. I mean, let's not forget that the moon, the ruler of the archetype and zodiacal sign Cancer, represents the cycles of nature. She rules the tides among her other main associations with motherhood, nurturing, family, compassion, and sensitivity. 
So since the human body is comprised of an average of 65% water, though this will vary based on one's age, one's health status, the amount of water they take in on a daily or weekly basis, their weight and their gender, it seems safe to say that the moon rules a large portion of our physical bodies and therefore how fluid fluctuations may affect our moods. So the moon's cancer, everybody knows that, you know, cancer is known to be moody, right? So the moon's cancer needs nurturance because when our emotions are in sync and stable, so is our physical body. And then the opposite is true. And let's remember as well that Uranus and Taurus, since the spring of 2018 and where he's going to be until July 2025, has wrought a multitude of societal changes, the worst of which is the damage being done by climate change. So there's a correlation now between the fact that Uranus is still transiting through Venus-ruled Taurus and we have Mars and Cancer, and both are representative of the feminine divine through the moon's Cancer and the Venus-ruled Taurus, and reverence for her natural cycles and the physical body, so many of which have been disrupted over long-term destruction of the earth, of our soil, our water, our air, etc., Thanks to Uranus's sudden shocks to our system, it's to the point now where such destruction has become obvious over the past few years, as has the need to do something about this. So when late Friday, March 24th, just hours before Mars' entrance into Cancer and quincunx to Pluto and Aquarius, which occurred early March 25th, tornadoes that tore through the state um, of Mississippi created a 170-mile trail of destruction across both Mississippi and Alabama, killed at least 26 people and knocked out power as such severe weather produced hail the size of golf balls moved through several southern states. Do you think we could see how pissed off Mother Nature is, not only at the abuse her bodies had to endure, but at the reckless and callous disregard of her needs over such a long period of time? Meanwhile, on March 25th, crews were continuing to search for survivors in the rubble of a chocolate factory that exploded on March 24th uh, and that evening in West Reading, Pennsylvania, killing seven and injuring 10 at the R.M. Palmer Company there. And according to ABC News, and here I quote, the explosion occurred around 4.57 p.m., that's on March 24th, at the R.M. Palmer Company in West Reading, located about 60 miles northwest of Philadelphia. It caused destruction to one building nearby and damaged another. And here's a quote, a former volunteer firefighter called the incident pretty scary, adding that it was so strong it pushed a building back four feet. The mayor said the factory building was pretty leveled and crews will probably be working through the weekend to clear the debris. Credited now to a potential gas leak, the National Transportation Safety Board is launching a safety investigation looking into the natural gas explosion and fire, end quote. So I just want to point out, this is a chocolate factory. And as we're approaching the spring holiday season, we've got Ramadan and upcoming Passover and Easter. Think about it. This is a time when families celebrate through food. I mean, most holidays we celebrate through food, but this has a particular correlation. Christmas and Easter have such a, and Hanukkah, such a particular correlation with chocolate. You know, particularly the Easter tradition of children frolicking around to hunt for hidden chocolate eggs and bunnies to place in their Easter baskets. And in case you're thinking the analogy of Mars-Pluto aspects or f frictional aspects to nuclear annihilation is overblown rhetoric, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, there's this from Reuters news service on March 25th. And here I quote again. Russia will station tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, President Vladimir Putin said on Saturday, that would be the, the 25th, sending a warning to NATO over its military support for Ukraine and escalating a standoff with the West. Um, although not unexpected, 
And while Putin said the move would not violate nuclear non-proliferation promises, it is one of Russia's most pronounced nuclear signals since the beginning of its invasion of Ukraine 13 months ago. Now, Putin likened his plans to the U.S. stationing its weapons in Europe and said that Russia would not be transferring control to Belarus, but this could be the first time since the mid-1990s that Russia will base such weapons outside the country, end quote. All right, so now let's talk about Donald Trump's hyperbolic rhetoric reported by the Washington Post on March 24th, and I quote, Trump warns of potential death and destruction if he's charged in hush money case related to alleged hush money payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels to conceal an affair. So I hope you're all getting that the rhetoric, the Mars-Pluto rhetoric is just so, you know, prevalent here. And Jupiter's expansion of it in Aries, right? I'm going to kill you, you know? Um, So the posting after midnight on Truth Social... Trump's social media platform was his latest and most explicit allusion to violence that could follow an indictment stemming from an investigation led by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, whom Trump calls a, quote, degenerate psychopath. Now, Trump wrote, and here's a, uh, here I quote, what kind of person can charge another person, in this case, a former president of the United States who got more votes than any sitting president in history and leading candidate by far, exclamation point, for the Republican Party nomination with a crime, which he capitalized with a capital C, when it is known by all that no, two caps, crime has been committed and also known that potential death and destruction in such a false charge could be catastrophic for our country, end quote. So this is a perfect example of how someone unable to recognize that their anger stems from unprocessed hurt became bombastic. And let's recall also that Trump's got an extremely dramatic Sagittarius moon too, and threatening Trump's a Leo rising with Mars on his ascendant which can often translate into someone who's got a chip on his shoulder, and that his post included a meme to social media of him holding a baseball bat adjacent to a picture in the frame of New York Attorney General Alan Bragg's head. And then, of course, there's the death threat letter, which is one among many, received by Alan Bragg just after Trump's threat was posted, and along with this picture of Trump looking like he was going to smash Bragg's brains out with a bat. And the letter said, I am going to kill you. And the envelope was filled with a white powder that was fortunately quickly determined to be non-lethal. So again, Mars Pluto. But the worst tragedy of all, born of a child turned adult's emotional pain, hurt, and distress occurred on March 27th as we approached the Cancer-Moon-Mars conjunction and the monthly lunar cycle's first quarter waxing cardinal square between the Moon and Cancer and the Sun and Aries. And that's when Audrey Hale, a former 28-year-old student of the Covenant School, a private Christian school educating about 200 students from pre-K through 6th grade, shot her way into her old school through a locked door and armed with three weapons, including at least one AR-15 rifle, killed three children and three adults before being shot by responding police officers. Now, this attack was the 19th shooting at an American school or university in 2023, and we are not quite yet done. Today's the last day of March. I mean, hello. And it was the 19th shooting in which at least one person was wounded, according to a CNN tally, and the deadliest since the May attack in Uvalde, Texas, left 21 dead. There have been 42 K-12 through school shootings since Uvalde. In fact, it's been known for a while that gun violence is the largest cause of children's deaths in this country. So yesterday, March 30th, we saw reactions to some of these events as Mars and Cancer trined Saturn and Aquarius. It's an airy trine. I'm sorry. Um, um, 
Yeah, that's not, hold on. I'm sorry, Saturn in Pisces. I'm, I'm looking here and I'm going, Cancer to Aquarius? No way. That was, it's not. So this is a watery trine, as I said. So let me just fix that because that's a typo. All right. As, uh, so we saw the reactions to some of these events as Mars in Cancer, trine Saturn in Pisces in the form of emotional outbursts by some on Capitol Hill as they raged against the continued shoulder shrugging on we by so many conservative representatives and senators beholden to the gun lobby campaign funds more than to the safety of children in this country. Now, an important thing to note, however, is that Mars watery trying to Saturn and Pisces, here I must have gotten it right, grants the patience and the willingness to do the hard work to find firmer emotional footing now. And that's both on a mundane collective level by those in Congress and on a personal one for all of us. Now, I believe that this can happen also in part through the Venus-Uranus in Taurus conjunction that happened yesterday, March 30th too, whereby our values may change suddenly based on surprising revelations about our relationships. And I think what I just said was part of this. So this will hopefully be the case especially since the Venus-Uranus in Taurus conjunction yesterday looks already likely to cause a sudden change in many folks' values based on the shock many felt at the callous, uncaring reactions of so many in power who actually could prevent such school shootings from recurring and other tragedies if they'd only support tougher gun laws. And that's despite the recent Supreme Court rulings gutting citizens' protections from such harm. Yesterday's Venus-Uranus conjunction took place at 16 degrees and 44 minutes of Taurus, close to the 16 degree 1 minute November 8, 2022 lunar eclipse, which was, of course, the day of the last U.S. midterm elections, now, since this conjunction can represent a rapid shift, rapid shift in what we value, again, particularly in terms of the relationships we feel we have, including with elected officials, Venus and Taurus being values around relationship, and Uranus as the natural ruler of the 11th house, representing sudden change in our elected officials, and of course, our values around them. So I'd remind everyone, too, that the November 8th eclipse's message, according to astrologer Bernadette Brady, known for her study and categorization of the general meanings of eclipses, designated this particular, particular set of eclipses, which occurred on October 25th, the solar eclipse, and November 8th, the lunar eclipse, as ones where groups would be able to take power, especially since the eclipses earlier that spring of 2022 reflected an energy of ailing father or authority figures. So in other words, to put it in plain English, if we're looking at it in the context of these astrological or zodiacal archetypes, and Uranus is the legislature and those in it, and they're not doing their jobs, they're failing us because they're weak, then we will be taking power from them, right? And the power will come through our shift in how we value people who are no longer doing their jobs, or at least based on our values, right? Which I think the majority of Americans agree, and they've pulled this, and I don't have those numbers, but you can see it on any news publication or news program, How many people agree with some kind of tighter regulation in terms of um, automatic weapons and so many other things, background checks and ages when you can buy them and all that stuff. So now, since Venus also recently conjoined the transiting north node, and she did that at four degrees Taurus, circa March 20 or 21st, which normally would have positive repercussions. I think I mentioned this briefly last week. Anything that goes over the North Node is moving us towards our higher purpose or our more beneficial destiny. It makes sense that we take note how last week the youngest new member of Congress elected last November 8th 
Represent, Ma Representative Maxwell or Congressman Maxwell Frost, who's a Democrat from Florida, walked out of a hearing last week discussing gun regulation when the grieving parents of a son killed in the Parkland, Florida high school shooting disrupted the hearing and the father was forcibly removed from the room and pinned to the ground and then arrested by Capitol Police. So I think we're seeing now the potential, again, at this Venus-Uranus conjunction at the November 8th, 2022 solar eclipse, uh, lunar eclipse degree of the ushering in, along with the um, Venus-North Node conjunction that I mentioned, we're ushering in the first Generation Z representative to the hallowed halls of Congress as a foreshadow of the future. And bear in mind <coughs> that the average age of members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, is now 58 years of age. Now, Representative Frost is 26th, and um, even though this current, yesterday's Venus, Uranus, and Taurus conjunction is brief, right? Venus moves pretty quickly. Um, the fact that it's on last year's lunar eclipse degree represents the future in terms of the younger generation's values and ideals, which are vastly different, particularly in the areas of most heated discussion on Capitol Hill, if not elsewhere, like gun regulation, abortion, climate change, LBTQ, LGBTQ rights, etc., from so many in Congress now. Representative Maxwell Frost, again, Generation Z's first congressman, slammed GOP House members as cowards in a blistering floor speech following the school shooting in Nashville, Tennessee, that left three children and three adults dead, according to the Huffington Post on March 28th, as we approached these March 30th aspects. Quote, I rise today because I am furious, angry that three kids died today in Nashville, Tennessee, Frost began, angry that hundreds of parents had to cry their eyes out today, not knowing if their child would come home from school, and angry that we have to live, uh, have to live day after day when we turn on the news and see rampant gun violence claiming life after life. Frost blamed Republican lawmakers bought and paid for by the NRA, that's the National Rifle Association, that put profits over people, over human lives. Frost ripped Republicans as cowards who wasted our time passing a parental bill of rights who didn't give a damn about the rights of children to go to their classroom without the fear of being gunned down due to senseless gun violence. It was likely that at this moment the next mass shooter is planning their shooting, he warned. What will this chamber do about it, Frost asked. Frost last week introduced a bill to create a federal office of gun violence prevention. Three kids are dead today, and every day that we wait, a hundred more people die, he said. I pray to God that there are some Republicans in this chamber that can help support my legislation to save lives. And so I think it's, you know, what's interesting too and in the news is that some people, pundits mostly, political pundits, have suggested that others are contemplating whether or not they should show the harm that an AR-15 and its bullets do to the body. In other words, it's an interesting concept. They mentioned um, Emmett Till and how his mother insisted on the open casket so that people could see how his body was mutilated, they're suggesting something similar and saying if people would look at and see the horrific, and I can't even look at these things because I won't sleep for the next four years, I can imagine them, and that's good enough for me. But for those who don't get it, it's like take a look at somebody whose face is blown off, you know, and that's all I'm going to say. But, you know, the, the inability to actually conceive what actually happened to not just children, children, of course, is most horrible, but to anybody, adults or otherwise, who get blown away by these assault weapons that are made for war. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, so I'll stop. But 
Um, also, just so you know, Frost was referring to the Parental Bill of Rights passed on March 24th, remember, leading up to all those other transits I just spent much of this podcast explaining, which according to the Hill publication, and here I quote, House Republicans passed an education bill on Friday that emphasizes parental rights in the classroom, leaning into a hot-button culture war issue that has gained popularity in GOP politics across the country. The legislation titled the Parents' Bill of Rights passed in a 213 to 208 vote, meaning the majority were Republicans, and it now heads to the Senate for consideration. It's highly unlikely, however, that the Democratic controlled chamber will take up the measure with House Democrats dubbing the bill the, quote, Politics Over Parents Act, end quote. Now, there's two sets of quotes. I, I didn't have time to get one, but uh, the first one is from New York Senator Chuck Schumer, who vowed already that this legislation will never get a vote in the Senate, and he called the bill Orwellian, you know, referring obviously to 1984 by, um, by George um, Orwell. Um, and, you know, I wanted to quote from an op-ed by Jamel Bowie, who is an excellent writer in the New York Times, who wrote um, about this bill and about this issue. And I'll quote, Parents' rights, you will have noticed, never seems to involve parents who want schools to be more open and accommodating toward gender nonconforming students. It's never invoked for parents who want their students to learn more about race, identity, and the darker parts of American history. And we never hear about the rights of parents who want schools to offer a wide library of books and materials to their children. The reality of the parents' rights movement is that it's meant to empower a conservative and reactionary minority of parents to dictate education and curriculums to the rest of the community. It is, in essence, an institutionalization of the heckler's veto in which a single parent, or any individual really, can remove hundreds of books or shut down lessons on the basis of the political discomfort they feel. Parents' rights, in other words, is when some parents have the right to dominate all the others. And of course, the point of this movement, the point of creating this state-sanctioned heckler's veto, is to undermine public education through a thousand little cuts, each meant to weaken public support for teachers and public schools and to open the floodgates to policies that siphon funds and resources from public institutions and pump them into private ones. The culture war that conservatives are currently waging over education is, like the culture wars in other areas of American society, a cover for a more material and ideological agenda. The screaming over wokeness is just another Trojan horse for a relentless effort to dismantle a pillar of American democracy that, for all of its flaws, is still one of the country's most powerful engines for economic and social mobility. Ultimately, then, the parents' rights movement is not about parents at all. It's about whether this country will continue to strive for a more equitable and democratic system of education or whether we'll let a reactionary minority drag us as far from that goal as possible in favor of something even more unequal and hierarchical than what we already have. End quote. I want to point out, too, that just after March 28th Cancer Moon Mars meetup and the first quarter monthly waxing lunar square of the Cancer Moon to the Aries Sun on the 28th, PBS reported the following on March 29th, and here I quote, Republican lawmakers in Kentucky on Wednesday swept aside the Democratic governor's veto of a bill regulating some of the most personal aspects of life for transgender young people, from banning access to gender-affirming health care to restricting the bathrooms they can use. The votes to override Governor Andy Beshear's veto were lopsided in both legislative chambers where the GOP wield super majorities and came on to the next to last day of this year's legislative session. The debate is likely to spill over into this year's gubernatorial campaign in Kentucky and could reach the courts if opponents follow through on the threat to mount a legal challenge against the bill. Now think again, that's the end quote, I'm saying now think again about Mother Nature and her wounded body, the earth, and how anyone 
so deeply hurt would lash out as further, um, you know, I mean, this is an attack, in other words, against your body. And an attack against your body is an attack against Mother Nature, the feminine divine cycles and other things that I pointed out, um, and how angry people are becoming. So, you know, as further proof of this, we have the fact that the goddess asteroid Ceres, who's known as Demeter in Greek mythology, and who's the mother of Persephone, who got raped and kidnapped by Hades Pluto and taken to the underworld, is currently waxing retrograde in Virgo and will exact oppose Neptune in Pisces at 26 degrees and five minutes of Virgo-Pisces polarity on April 11th. However, Ceres will be within a degree of opposition to Neptune at this upcoming Libra full moon. So I want everyone to keep that in mind because Ceres is um, sustenance and faith, right? Again, I, can't, I don't have time to go into the whole mythology. I've explained it before. But when Persephone was kidnapped, Demeter stopped the crops from growing because she held the secret to how the seed germinates the egg or the seed gets germinated or whatever the biological explanation is. I wasn't a big biology student. But anyway, you get what I mean. So if you can't germinate the seed, you can't reproduce. If you can't reproduce, you can't grow crops. If you can't grow crops, you basically can't eat. Um, or so the agrarian societies, you know, uh, had a lot of problems. So if if you can't feed the people... Uh, I guess there's only so many bison to go around and things like that, then they'll starve. And so Ceres has to do with sustenance, and she's considered to be like a minor moon because it, through sustenance, through food, we sustain our bodies, right? And that keeps us in a healthy flow. And like I said before, if we hydrate properly, then our moods are stable and you know we can think um, rationally. So um, Mercury is going to enter Taurus on Monday, April 3rd, and then almost immediately square Pluto in Aquarius. And that is going to make communication about some of these changed values that I've spoken, the subject of potential opposition now. So whenever Mercury, um, well, what I want to point out here is that we, got news today, um, well, yesterday, which is March 30th, that an American journalist who works for the Wall Street Journal, who is stationed in Russia, has been arrested by the Russian government, at, which claims that he's a spy. So I think we're seeing early the manifestation of this Mercury in Taurus squaring Pluto and Aquarius. Yes, I know it's a few days early, but I keep saying that these these things are waxing. And if you see things that happen, Mercury communication telling, you know, the, the earthy truth in Taurus, right? Um, squaring Pluto in Aquarius, which is that nuclear energy. It's like Pluto and Aquarius is saying, shut the F up. And Mercury and Taurus is saying, but wait a minute, I just want to, but uh, look, I did, because Taurus has a connotation with naivete. It's like, but I just, look, I just saw that. I'm going to write about it. No, you're not. You know, we're going to throw you in prison. So this hasn't happened for quite some time. And it seems that this is probably a manipulative ploy on the part of the Russians to have a hostage that they can take and then use, like they did with Brittany Griner, um, to exchange them for somebody of political prominence that they want back in Russia. Uh, that goes without saying that Paul Whelan, who is someone who's been in Russian custody and jail there for four years, is still also someone that we would like to get out. So there's been a manipulative, violent ploy here as we, you know, as, as we're approaching this aspect. Now, when Mercury in Taurus sextiles Saturn in Pisces by April 5th, we might be able to more clearly discern the forest from the trees and understand what really does need to change on a practical level now. And I'm moving away from the topic of Russia. 
And when the sun conjoins wounded healer Chiron and Aries that day, then we have a, you know, a call to take a stand to defend and protect those weaker and more wounded than ourselves. So this all occurs, and all of this that I've been talking about is leading up to the Libra full moon, which I gave you the the coordinates and the times earlier in the podcast, which will oppose the Aries sun along with Chiron and Jupiter, like I said, late on April 5th or early the 6th, depending on your time zone. And that is going to urge us to release any anger or vengefulness that we mistakenly feel is necessary to help us heal. And instead, the Libra moon preaches negotiation and compromise to better understand the derivation of our wounds and then to understand that forgiving others helps us in turn forgive ourselves too. I mean, the moon is about balance in Libra and it's about compassion and it's about nurturing. So all these things and the series opposite Neptune, which is waxing into fruition and will be, as I said, only a degree apart in opposition to each other at this lun- at this lunation, is saying, let me reclaim the sorrow and the um, grief of the collective as my own. Because if I, you know, an opposition is always relationship oriented because you usually identify with one and cast out the other. So it's becoming more conscious about the fact that, you know, I mean, Neptune... It's always, do I not bleed? Am I not human? You know, can you walk a mile in my shoes? Can I walk a mile in your shoes? And can we find better balance here instead of hating each other to love each other? So, um, you know, at the, um, just before, I think it is the, the new moon, I'm sorry, the full moon, uh, we have a Venus, Neptune sextile, um, What I started to say, and I didn't finish, is that this Libra new moon opposing the sun in Aries is like saying, let's negotiate, let's compromise, let's think about finding a better balance because you're too angry, right? Let's find a better way. And then a Venus-Neptune sextile, which perfects on April 7th, gives us the opportunity, like I said about the series opposite Neptune, to acutely feel the needs and emotions of each other, of others. So expressing ourselves creatively is called for now, and that's aided by Mercury's sextile to Mars and Cancer late that day or early April 8th, which is after this lunation, and that will spur us to have the confidence to express our ideas and opinions forcefully and convincingly while avoiding negative pushback. So this is kind of a juxtaposition, right? We've got Mercury square Pluto on the third, and then we've got um, after Mercury enters Taurus, which is a much more loving communication, you know, communicative way, but then Mercury squares Pluto. So Pluto says, you know, screw that, that love and light stuff. I'm still here for revenge, as Putin is proving and the wider collective. But then we have calmer energies as we approach the Libra full moon of the Mercury and Taurus sextile Saturn in Pisces and the sun conjoining Chiron, right? Now, I would point out that the sun conjoined Chiron is an aspect that we uh, see in the um, U.S. Sibley chart from July 4th of of 1776, So in essence, if you want to see or understand what a wounded sun Jupiter looks like, well, it's the hero with an Achilles heel, which is a weak spot, often the result of excessive pride or arrogance. And it's what we might call someone who's gotten too big for their britches or who tries to lord it over everyone else. And then again, as I said, this is an aspect that exists, or this is an energy that exists in the U.S. Sibley chart I just mentioned from July 4th, 76, that has a seventh house of partnership, which is ruled naturally by Venus's Libra, everyone's seventh house is, with Cancer, Sun, and Jupiter conjunct in that house, but square to its fourth house of home, 
family, roots, tradition, the past, memory, and mother-father with Chiron and Aries in it. So we know that we're, we're, you know, what's going on here in this country is deeply reflected in the events that are happening here now. And so, you know, um, I mean, there's a Sun, uh, Jupiter, Venus conjunction, but Venus is a little further away. And I think, you know, there's a little bit of, um, for lack of a better word, let me just say schizophrenic, schizophrenic notion of ourselves as Americans. We settled the country by causing genocide to the indigenous peoples who were here. And yet er, throughout our history, we laud as heroes those who did that settling, you know, those who destroyed a culture that came before it so that they could have the land. Now, I had wanted to talk, and I guess I will do this next week, because this Libra full moon is going to land prominently in Trump's chart and also in Benjamin Netanyahu's chart. And I haven't had time to go into the wound to our sense of justice in terms of moral justice in terms of law. So I am going to get that to that next week. But first, I want to say that the Libra full moon in general, okay, given this information and given the fact that I think it this this new moon is going to land, I'm sorry, I keep saying new moon, and I mean full moon, so forgive me, um, that it will land, you know, pretty prominently as a recurrence of some of the energies that are already inherent in charts like the U.S., in charts like Donald Trump's, and in charts like Benjamin Netanyahu's, who I'll explain next week about, because he also has a Libra south node, and um, he has a stellium, but he has a wounded Jupiter as well. Anyway, um, the question this Libra full moon will pose is, how do you negotiate with someone whose sense of justice is wounded, whose sense of identity and true purpose are overblown and egotistical? Okay, that's the Aries Sun, Chiron, Jupiter. Do you seek to placate them, sweet talk them? Like what? What will work in order to get them to lay down their sword and shield of arrogance and excessive pride? Do you cajole them? That's part of Libra's potential quality. Promise them you'll treat them fairly, balance their complaints and hurts with ways that treat their inner pain of feeling less than. You can see that with the Libra moon, we're talking about moon is, is also nurturing children, right? So you, this kind of attitude or approaching it from this perspective is like a mother who's trying to soothe the child. No, honey, it's okay. You know, oh, you're upset because Billy got a bigger piece of pie than you did? All right, let's go out and I'll get you a little more pie. You know, there are ways to placate someone that are not necessarily going to harm anybody. Anyway, and that's Libra Moon's intent. But in terms of, you know, treating others fairly and balancing their complaints and hurts, on the negative side, we've seen how well that's been working for someone like GOP House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy so far. I mean, basically, he's been catering to autocratic demands, especially over the looming battle on the budget deficit, which is sure to hit the fan very soon. And, you know, people, like I said before, with a wounded set of values, most prominently Donald Trump with his Juno, Chiron, Jupiter, second house stellium in Libra and his attacks on so many things, but among them most fervently, his disdain, disrespect, and disregard for the judiciary, the legal system, and the law. So the Libra full moon has her work cut out for her here. And as she opposes the Sun, Chiron, and Jupiter in Aries, she will also quincunx Uranus and Taurus at this lunation. So perhaps her best shot at getting through to a hubristic sort who thinks he's God is to adjust her way of approaching him by trying something new rather than the same old, same old technique. It's not just put down your gun because we have you surrounded. It's more like the moon's quincunx to Uranus and also her trying to hygieia in Aquarius, which is the goddess asteroid of health, require a more psychological approach. Um, I'm not, you know, hygieia in certain zodiacal signs or positions or aspects can also be about mental health. So, you know, I'm saying that 
the Libra moon will have to cajole Hygeia uh, and adjust, or well, communicate with someone as though they've been traumatized. That's what I'm trying to say. So this is like moving resources from shouting, threatening police with guns to mental health practitioners with softer, more healing tones and is indicative that this Libra moon needs to try a different, like I said, more outside the box approach because you get more flies with honey than with vinegar, right? So rather than fight fire with fire, she can call upon her dispositor Venus and Taurus who stands a better chance at dialogue since she'll be trying Pluto and Aquarius and sextile Neptune and Pisces. And, you know, then there's Mars and Cancer trying Saturn in Pisces who form a grand trine with the Scorpio South Node at this lunation. And together, perhaps they can feel into the Jupiter Sun Chiron wound at this lunation and manage to get them to speak about what's wounded them in the past. So, you know, a lot of this is up for discussion and uh, it's going to be, um, you know, in a sense that the Louis Bramoon may gently try to tell the son he's been wounded and to do so, she'll have to be diplomatic and pick and choose her words carefully. It's like, how do you tell Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene, not just that they're full of you know what, but that maybe they've been wounded and that's why they are full of you-know-what. So the Libra Moon's not interested in escalating the situation. She's, rather, she's interested in diffusing it by placating through negotiation and ultimately some kind of compromise. So the question is whether the Sun, Jupiter, and Chiron in their current state will simmer down long enough to listen, and even if they do, to understand. And that would be moving us toward the Taurus Mercury North Node, towards peace, serenity, and harmony, towards negotiation and compromise, toward making love, not war. All right, so my time's up. As I said, there was a lot to get to. I left a lot out. There's a lot of, um, of things that have happened that I wanted to mention, but to go into them would just have taken too long, and then you'd be listening to me forever and falling asleep, But if you haven't already. But thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you found the information here uh, presented here helpful as you continue your karmic evolution in this lifetime. And please be sure to join me next week on April 7th for another episode of Karmic Evolution's Astrologically Speaking podcast. Namaste. Long ago before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come And free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book